Hello, I'm Dr. Annadale, and I teach philosophy at Mount St. Mary's University and Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. I want to say a few words today about Aristotle's theory of the soul. I will talk first about uh, how it contrasts with Plato's dualistic theory of the soul. I'll say a little bit about first and second actuality, and then I will talk briefly about the powers of the soul. Now, Aristotle's theory of the soul is best understood in terms of two other doctrines. First, the body and soul are joined together for Aristotle as matter and form. And like matter and form, they are inseparable. Second, all transitory existence for Aristotle moves from potentiality to actuality. So for example, a seed grows into a tree. The seed lacks, does not lack the form of the tree and it doesn't lack the matter of the tree. But if it has the same form and the same matter, why do we not say that it is identical to the tree? In a sense it is, in a sense the seed and the tree are the same thing, but they're not strictly identical, there's something different about them, and that difference is exactly what Aristotle wants to talk about. <clears throat> in a similar way we could say that the calf that grows up into a full-grown cow is not identical with the cow, but it plainly is the same being. So how are they different? Well, in growing, the seed produces another embodiment of its form, that is the tree. This form was present, always as potential, but was actualized through growth. And it is the inner telos, or entelechy, of the seed, of the living thing. Its development, or movement from potentiality to actuality, constitutes its process of growth, and as it unfolds over time. Now, thinking about the human soul as an entelechy allows Aristotle to avoid the dualism of Plato's theory of the soul. Plato, the Pythagoreans, and even the Stoics tended to see the soul as inhabiting the body, the way a pilot inhabits a ship. Uh, think of the uh, dialogue at the end of Phaedo, the death scene, where Crito asks Socrates, how shall we bury you? And Socrates says, any way you can, if you can catch me. Then he teases Crito, saying, Crito imagines that this dead body he will encounter in an hour's time is actually Socrates, but really the real Socrates will be gone. The real Socrates is the soul of Socrates. What you'll look at after my death is simply the, the empty container that Socrates used to inhabit. This is Plato's dualism about the body and the soul. But Aristotle holds that the substantial reality of a human being is the union of body and soul. Without the soul, the body does not exist as a unity, and the soul cannot exist apart from its body. Uh, one uh, helpful way to think about this that I get from Jonathan Barnes is to think of, for Aristotle, having a soul is rather like having a skill. Nobody thinks of a carpenter's skill as somehow being a part of the carpenter or inhabiting the carpenter uh, at some uh, particular place, his hand or his brain or elsewhere. That's not the kind of thing that skill in carpentry is. And that's not the kind of thing that a soul is either. It's not part of the self, it is an ability or a skill that the self possesses. It's the power to do certain things that the self does. Now, one important consequence of this theory of the soul is that each soul is united to one and only one body. So there can be no transmigration of souls, there can be no reincarnation, something that Plato believed in, and there also can be no otherworldly afterlife. There is no ghostly Socrates floating around in Hades or dwelling up among the forms. That simply is not something that happens. An interesting question for Christian theology would be whether you can take this theory of the soul and combine it with the Christian doctrine of the resurrection of the body and come up with a workable system of theology. I'll leave that for the theologians to work it out, but it's worth some attention. Another important consequence is that this doctrine gives unity to each human being. Uh, Aristotle rejects Plato's multi-part soul. He says, I don't feel desire in one part of my soul and anger or shame in a different part of my soul simultaneously. I have a single soul which has multiple powers. Now, for Aristotle, the soul is not a substance in the fullest sense, but the soul actualizes matter into a composite. And this composite, this actualized matter, actualized body, ensouled body, that is substance in the fullest sense. Thus, for Aristotle, the oneness of the body and soul is not an interesting question. And he actually says this, this is on page uh, 555 of the Machaean basic works of Aristotle. Aristotle writes, 
That is why we can wholly dismiss as unnecessary the question of whether the soul and body are one. It is as meaningless as to ask whether the wax and the shape given to it by the stamp are one. Okay, Aristotle says, this is not an interesting question. Obviously they are one and inseparable. Let's move on to some interesting questions. So an interesting question is going to be, for Aristotle, how does the soul actualize the body? What are these kinds of actualization? So let me give you an example to explain something of this. The soul, for Aristotle, is the first actuality of the body and is therefore inseparable from it. So think of three people. Uh, Arthur. Arthur is totally ignorant about something. Let's say it's the Pythagorean theorem. Arthur does not know the Pythagorean theorem, but he is capable of learning about it. If somebody taught it to him, he could learn it. He could have the knowledge, he just doesn't have it right now. That's Arthur. Now, second person, Bob. Bob knows the Pythagorean theorem, but he's not thinking about it right now because he's asleep. That's my second person, Bob. Now, the third person, Chris, knows the Pythagorean theorem and is, right now, explaining it to someone else. Now, what are we going to say about this? Obviously, Arthur's knowledge of the Pythagorean theorem is potential only. He doesn't have it. He could conceivably have it, but that's the best we're going to get for Arthur. Bob has the knowledge in a way. He has acquired it. It's filed away in his mind, but he's not using it right now because he's doing something else. He's sleeping. Chris has the knowledge in the fullest possible way. He both possesses the knowledge and he's putting it to use right now by thinking about it as he explains it to somebody else. So in Aristotle's language, we would say that Chris has actualized his knowledge in two senses. He possesses it and he's using it, whereas Bob has only the first actualization. We would say Bob's knowledge is both actual in the sense that he has the knowledge and potential in the sense that he's not making full use of the knowledge right now. So there, these are the first and second levels of actuality in the soul. For Aristotle, the soul is the first actuality of the body. The second actuality of the body is the soul acting, living well. So being alive is the first actuality. Living well is the second actuality. Now, the soul for Aristotle is not a type of activity, but instead it is the potential or the ability to engage in certain kinds of activities. Most importantly, the activities of nutrition, sensation, and thought. Furthermore, it's not an undeveloped potential, like Arthur's knowledge. Rather, it is the actualized potential to engage in some sorts of activities. So the, these are the powers of the soul. The basic powers of the soul are the powers of nutrition and growth, and these are typical of plants. Add to these the powers of sensation, of motion, and of feeling pleasure and pain, and these are the powers that animals have, the additional powers that animals have in addition to the plant powers. And then the last power of the soul are the powers of thought and intellect, which human beings uniquely possess. And it's possession of those extra powers that sets us above animals the same way that animals are set above plants. Okay? It's not a matter of sort of interspecies bigotry, it's simply that we can do more stuff. We have more ability to do things with our souls, the same way that animals can do things that plants can't we can do things with the intellect, thought, and understanding that animals are not capable of. Now, about this power of thought, Aristotle makes an observation that there's something unusual about thought. It seems potentially to be separable from the soul. Now, this might be a kind, we might suspect this of being a kind of backsliding towards a Platonic dualism, but Aristotle's making an important observation. He's recognizing that of all the powers of the soul, thought is somehow different. He says, this is page 558 in the Kean, it alone is capable of existence in isolation from all other psychic powers. And that would lead me to speculate that if there's any part of the soul that could potentially survive death and separation from the body, it would be the intellectual part of the soul. That's going to be important for theologians later on. So uh, to wrap up, let me just contrast briefly the Aristotelian soul with the Cartesian idea of the soul, which will be important when we look at modern philosophy later on. Aristotle's idea of the soul is definitely not Cartesian. Okay, there is no distinction in Aristotle between the inner and outer uh, realms of the soul. There's no sense of special privilege in my access to a knowledge about my own perceptual states, my own thoughts and knowledge. Secondly, the soul for Aristotle is not a substance, but a capacity. So the question of how the soul substance relates to the body substance never comes up for Aristotle, where that becomes a problem that occupies Descartes uh, for a tremendous amount of uh, 
just to just take hard a lot of difficulty. And finally, for Aristotle, there's very the soul has very little to do with my own sense of individuality, with my own personality, with what separates me from other beings. That is all going to come from my body, from my matter. The soul is simply going to be that which animates my body, which allows me to be alive and to exercise the different activities that I actually exercise in the course of being alive. So that's my brief introduction to Aristotle's uh, theory of the soul. Uh, thank you for watching today. Goodbye.